Eberron, Rising from the Last War, is one of the official campaign settings for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition from Wizards of the Coast. This is the special edition cover, which I find more appealing than the regular edition cover. Other than that, the two editions are exactly the same. Let's start far in the back. There's a map in here, which is perforated to be taken out, which I have never seen before, but it works fairly well. This is a double-sided color map. One side, where you've got the continent of Kowur, the main gaming world of Eberron. And on the other side, we've got the whole world of Eberron, with Kowur and the other continents that are briefly mentioned in the books. I'll briefly go through the book and show you my highlights. I first thought Eberron was a steampunk world when I first saw it many years ago, coming out for third edition, but I find that I'm actually wrong. It is not steampunk at all. It's more a kind of magic punk, because instead of using uh, steam technology, everything, every machinery in Eberron is based on magic. So they got like flying ships, um, robots, androids, and uh, trains, and it's all powered by magic. But you also get the main theme of, uh, of the punk genre, if you so will, of high technology and low life. So we got lots of criminal activity, conflict, and slums, and drug abuse, and everything in here. One of the main themes of Eberron is the Last War, where Pretty much every nation on Korea was pitched against every other nation. And that war was only ended when the so-called Morning, a uh, big magical cataclysm, swallowed the central land in Korea. And because no one knew what had happened, how it happened, and why it had happened, uh, they stopped fighting and bargained an uneasy peace treaty. Chapter 1 is character creation. You can use any 5e race or class, though not all races are as prominent on Korea than they are in like the Forgotten Realms. But you get some additional races that are uh, more prominent on Convert than anywhere else or are exclusive to this world. Got like changelings that can change their appearance at will. You got goblinoids that are not simply uh, a monster type on Convert but actually have their own nations where bugbears, hobgoblins and goblins all live and work together. You've got Kalashtar, which are humans that are possessed by a spirit from the realm of dreams. You've got orcs, you've got shifters, which um, are humanoids that can have uh, animal-like aspects. They're not like uh, complete werewolves, complete lycanthropes or anything. Finally, we got warforged, which are a uh, kind of magical 
humanoid construct that was created during the war to serve as soldiers. And as constructs they, for example, don't need to sleep, eat or breathe. Finally, we got dragon marks. You can use dragon marks to alter some of the existing races like humans, elves, dwarves, halflings, gnomes and gives them more of a magical ability. Each dragon mark um, replaces some of the race's ability with magical ability. And these regular dragon marks usually belong to a dragon mark house. And the houses are a huge force on Kovea. They are like uh, major corporations rivaling the nations of Kovea and their influence and power. And they each specialize in uh, a trade associated with their dragon mark. For example, the mark of hospitality they have a chain of taverns all over the land. And since they are industry, they work to supplant all other taverns. What sets Eberron apart from um, many other D&D settings is that this is not really uh, high fantasy and not really classical fantasy where there's clear line between good and evil. It's mostly depending on your perspective. There are many different factions. There are different faith, different nations and they all have their own agendas and if you believe them to be good and evil mostly depends on your own perspective. So this goes more into something like a noir genre, maybe hardball detective genre, or the sword and sorcery genre, so there's way too much magic for that in here. Where the, the morale of the characters involved in any given story is more gray and gray than having clear lines between black and white. New class in Eberron is the Artificer, which is a kind of spellcaster that uses magical artifacts and trinkets to cast their spells. They are not exclusive to Eberron, you can also use them in any other D&D world but they are most prominent in Eberron. And we've got something called the Wand Slinger. He uses magic wands as their main weapons. Um, by default, there's no black powder in Eberron, just like there's no steam power. But you can introduce black powder weapons if you want to. And the artificer would be uh, skilled in using those. But I think um, to stay in the theme of magic technology, I wouldn't introduce black powder into Eberron. There's more than enough magic to make things go boom. For character creation, Eberron has what they call group patrons, which basically means that the group belongs or takes work from, is allied to a powerful individual or faction in the world of Eberron. So from the get-go, they are involved in the machinations of the different factions. And there's an extensive list, complete with uh, contacts and adventure hooks and examples you can use for your group. Chapter 2 
is the description of the different nations in Kuwait and also the other continents on Eberon. They all have a brief description about the land and people, some cities you might find here, and uh, included in here are adventure hooks you can use if you want to set an adventure on set nations. Many of these take the form of these newspaper excerpts like Wizard War Brewing at Arcanix and they uh, give you like a short in-universe text, short fluff text you can use as an adventure hook as an idea for an adventure or maybe even a whole campaign work your way from there. And there's lots of this strewn throughout the whole book. There are so many adventure ideas. The nations are pretty varied with the themes they touch upon. For example, Arcanics is uh, more of a high magic, medieval, maybe even Harry Potter themed nations, nation, while Kubara is more of a frontier nations that touches on the theme of old Wild West movies or spaghetti westerns. And Karnath touches more on themes of gothic horror with uh, cold winters, undeads, and a uh, church that is a bit of blood cold. We also get the faith of Kuvea. It is faith and not gods, because contrary to other settings, the gods do not directly get involved in the affairs of the mortals. And it's more a clash of different faith, belief, and churches than a clash of gods. Chapter 3 is a description of Shan, the city of towers, the biggest city in Colbert, that is made up of huge, tall towers connected by sky bridges. And you've got sky carriages flying around the place. And you should have tokens of featherfall, lest you fall off one of the bridges and fall to your doom. The city is divided as much by its quarters as it is by its height. Generally, the further up you are in the city, the higher class, the richer and more influential the inhabitants are, the cleaner the streets and the safer it is. And if you go lower, uh, the opposite is the case with slums and criminal activity running rampart in the lower city. By the way, I don't really like this map. It, in my mind, is a contrast to the other artwork that depict a uh, more fantastical city than this map. This looks like they just stuck some medieval castle towers together. Don't really like this map. Shan is a very varied city. You will find members of uh, most nations and most mortal races in Shan. You will find members of each of the dragon mark houses in Shan. Each big criminal faction has a chapter in Shan. You find high and low life. There is so much to uh, see, so much to discover and uncover. In Shan alone, you could spend a whole campaign just in the city. Chapter 4 is the GM section, Building Eberron Adventures. They go more into detail with adventure themes that work well with the Eberron setting. 
Eberron lends itself well to a more pulpy, high-stakes adventure feel with uh, deep intrigue and high-octane action. You can have uh, fights on sky bridges involving sky carriages, spies exchanging hostages on mist-covered bridges. This section also covers a lot of the powerful and potentially antagonistic factions in Eberron, but it leaves their real motivation open to open for the GM to decide. So they are not necessarily evil or anything. And you can use these ideas that are presented here to make whatever campaign you want to run. And there's lots of ideas in here to create adventure hooks, to create NPCs. Some locations, some maps as well. There is really a lot and I mean a lot of material in here. One antagonist faction which I find most interesting is the Dreaming Dark. Hailing from uh, the plane of Dalcor, the plane of dreams, they can't influence the mortal world directly, so they work through dreams and hosts. And they are trying to plunge the continent into chaos, into a new war. So the reign of darkness in the plane of dreams, Dalcor, will continue for the foreseeable future. We've got a description how travel in Eberron works, how the trains, flying ships and ocean-going ships work. Basically, they are powered by bound elemental spirits. We've got huge tables for adventures in Shan itself. There's one starting adventure in the book for level 1 characters that serves as an introduction to the city of Shan, Forgotten Relics. And it is actually a quite substantial adventure filled with lots of high stakes action that you don't normally see in a level 1 adventure. Chapter 5, we finally get some items, magical items, that are, that are unique to Eberron. For example, we get uh, magical prosthetics or symbiotic weapons like Duran's tentacle whip that bound to the user. Chapter 6 is pretty much the best story of Eberron with some powerful antagonists and monsters that you may want to use in your campaign. Some of these are variants on monsters we already know from the monster manual, but some of these are unique to Aberon. All in all, I uh, like the Aberon campaign setting and I like this book. There's lots of material in here. Uh, in my mind, I could use some more random tables. I love my random tables and I would have loved if these were not just D6 tables but D20 tables. And I could have used just a few more pages of this. And while there is a lot of artwork, 
I would have loved to see some more of it. Maybe some more whole page or even double page spreads of artwork to get more of a feeling for the world and its different cultures. I would have loved to have artwork for like a typical representative of a nation so I get a feel of uh, their fashion basically what the people are wearing and I would have liked more description of the races that are unique to Eberron. I mean the Warforged which are really unique to Eberron and I haven't seen in any other D&D setting before only get like one page and that's it and I feel there could have been more there could have been Warforged sub races and a few more illustrations about how different types of Warforged might look like a bit of more text how they integrate into society or not you find some of it strewn all over the book but I would have preferred to have more right here for a player to read so he can uh, make up his mind on if to play a Warforged and how to play a Warforged. But if I were to run a uh, D&D 5 game right now, I would surely set it in Eberron. It's a very unique setting that is welcome change from the other established D&D settings with its magic punk noir feel with its more gray and gray moralities with its flying ship and lightning rail lines have you played Nebron yet? How do you like it? Or what is your favorite D&D uh, &D setting? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and goodbye.